Hello and welcome to day four of our reading through the Gospel of Luke and Acts in 102 days. Today is Thursday, July the 25th, 2024. Thank you for tuning in and don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it comes up so you can be notified whenever content is added to the channel. And don't forget to comment on these videos, like them, share them, give them a thumbs up if you really like it so it can help it to grow i can't grow the channel without the help of loyal viewers such as yourself so we're continuing on in luke and luke uh, chapters one and two are pretty long chapters if you haven't already noticed uh we are in, starting with uh, luke uh, chapter one verse 67 today and then going to uh chapter two verse seven now his now as John the Baptist has been born, Zacharias can now talk as his mouth had been sealed uh, uh, because of his unbelief when uh, he was told he would have a son in his young age or his wife would conceive and give birth to a son. And uh, now Zacharias is remember his tongue and his mouth were sealed when uh, he disbelieved the angel Gabriel who met him in the temple when he was burning incense. Be he had unbelief, uh, his attitude, and I'm guessing it might have had something to do with his attitude too. So he was told you're not going to be able to speak, you're going to be completely mute, not a sound, until the child is born. And when they went to name the child and asked his mother, well, what's his name going to be? Oh, we're going to call him John. Well, what? There's nobody in your family by that name. Hey, uh, Zacharias, what do you want to call him? Uh, oh, he needs something to write with. Okay. Mm, his name will be called John. Okay. Uh, so that's basically what happened. So now verse 67, his father Zacharias is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited his people and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for use in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us, to perform the mercy pr promised to us, to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to his father Abraham, to our father Abraham, I really did learn to read, believe it or not, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him in the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring from, our high has visited, from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So now we come into chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census took place while Quir Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered to, with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, notice it says uh, her firstborn son. So now we come into chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, and everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. 
And so it was while they were there that her days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, notice uh, a couple of things here that uh, she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, if she had a firstborn son, we can infer that there was a, a, at least one more son born. Uh, in other words, the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she had no other children, remained a virgin, of her life, uh, remained a virgin all of her life, is not true. Uh, the Catholic Church likes to carry that forth. I don't know about the Lutherans or the Episcopals or any of the other so-called high churches, but that's a, a key doctrine in the Catholic Church, and it's simply not true. We know that there were other uh, children born. He has at least four brothers that, were, that are named. Uh, they are not just like close relatives that they might call a brother or something like that. From the context in Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 13, they're brothers. They are siblings or what we would call half-brothers because they all have the same mother, but they don't have the same father. Uh, and, and he had at least two sisters, I think at least three sisters. So there were plenty of other kids in the household. And second, you notice this here. There was no room for them in the inn. Now, when the kids do the nativity play at Christmas, and they get to the scene where Mary and Joseph are coming in, they're usually walking although we did do a live nativity scene where they had actual animals, an actual donkey and three camels for the wise men. I'm not, no, yeah, true, true story. And they brought them into the, the, uh, build, uh, the building. And in fact, uh, one of the wi wise men was a friend of mine. I called him a wise guy. And uh, he got down off the camel. They were all made up in costumes of the period. And the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, he got off the camel and his wife was, I think she was holding the reins for the camel. He got off and she was supposed to bow down to him. And she said, this is the only time I'm ever bowing down to you. It, it was kind of funny watching her, uh, when they were preparing for the role. And she told me about that. It was kind of funny watching her. But anyway, what I was getting at is the innkeeper is always portrayed as the bad guy. In fact, the way a lot of times it gets portrayed as Mary and Joseph, they go to one end, he opens the door and they there's usually music, a musical overlay. So they just sort of go through the motions. Like they're talking, the door gets slammed. They go to the second, the third, usually about the third or fourth one. Uh, they end up in, in the, uh, usually it's a barn, but it was most likely a cave, but the innkeeper's the bad guy for some reason. But did you ever think of the room was already full or the inn was already full the inn. Okay. Notice it's a definite article and inn is singular. So it looks like there was only one. And so they get there and it might've been just a room or two rooms in somebody's house, or maybe uh, the innkeeper had his and his family's house and behind him was a structure building where they rented out to travelers. So it wasn't a monstrosity uh, convention center with hundreds of rooms and uh, meeting rooms and continental breakfast and all those things that we take for granted today. So, and, and in fact, the final place where she got to give birth, he might've offered it to them. Uh, yeah, sorry. I see your wife's pregnant and yeah, it looks like she's about to deliver any time. Now we're full. We don't have the room, but Hey, I've got this barn over here or this, uh, uh stable, this cave, whatever, you can go in there and at least get out of the elements and at least have a place that's safe. And, and you, you know, I'll get you some, uh, I'll get you, I got this, uh, a manger, which was really a feeding trough that the, they would put food in or water for the animals. You know, it's not the best, but Hey, maybe he can put some straw in there and at least make it a little comfortable and the baby can be safe. He might've actually tried to do whatever he could in this situation. We don't know. You know, he might have been, you know, a horrible person. We just don't know uh, enough about that situation to really be able to say. So speaking of all that, let's go over here to the PowerPoint for just a minute. Now, looking at uh, Zachariah's song and uh, the major emphasis 
uh, that it is here in the in the narrative uh, and how it stresses the uh, importance of John as being the forerunner of Jesus. Remember, that is his lot in life, if you will. John is to blaze the trail. He is to prepare the way uh, for the Lord to come. And he will, during his ministry, say, look, I've got to decrease so he can increase. And then uh, he's subordinate, or it, John is subordinate to Jesus. And we can see that in, in what he said and in what Elizabeth said. He is the prophet of the Most High versus Mary's child, who is the son of the Most High. And then uh, this is weaving the story of John and Jesus into one tapestry uh, for God's purpose. A tapestry is like a long, think of a long, like, uh, for lack of a better term, blanket that uh, tells a story. This is an illustration of what a tapestry would look like. This is actually a tapestry that tells the story of the Battle of Hastings in 1066, where King Harold II uh, was killed, and when William uh, of Normandy came over and invaded England, became William the Conqueror because of that, and all the British monarchs from that time descend from him. Uh, and this is the one, this is where the idea that Harold got shot in the eye with an arrow, he most likely, he wasn't. I mean, that would have been too lucky of a shot. But uh, this up here, the Latin, this is, uh, no, that's not the part that I thought it was. But the part uh, that has got Harold the King, and it, uh, it says in Latin, Harold the King died and the figure believed to be Harold the King has a stitch going towards his eye. And there's a, another story behind that as to what that means, and it's not relevant to us here. I just wanted to show you this so you can see, get an idea of what a tapestry is, uh, using that as an illustration uh, here when uh, he said that uh, it weaves the records of John and Jesus into one tapestry of God's purpose. That, that's what a tapestry is. So anyway, continuing on, we also see that uh, as with the other hymns in Luke's birth narrative, like Mary's hymn or song, Zechariah's song completes a three-part pattern. In this case, there's the promise of a son, the birth of a son, and a praise response. And then uh, Zechariah's song highlights the key motives that pervade in Luke chapters 1 and 2. The covenant making a God a continue uh, continuity with Abraham and fulfillment of various uh, expectations associated with David. So this is all tying everything together uh, in kind of one nice neat little package as what Zacharias and Mary to an extent is doing too. And then this is what, uh, where did I get this from? The Life Application Commentary Series, uh, Zacharias, uh, the parent's prayer, Zacharias looking at his son, and I, I don't have sons, I've got one daughter, and uh, she's adopted, bringing her home, and I, I understand this to, to an extent, that you've got a child, uh, and you're, you're, you're holding this newborn baby, whether it's your biological child or your adopted child, and you're thinking, okay, what could this child be? And we all think, okay, this child I could be holding a future president of the United States. I could be holding the, the uh, uh, doctor who's going to eventually cure cancer. There's all the, we always have these big hopes for our, for our children. Now, in John's case, or Zacharias' case, he was told, your son's going to be a prophet. Mary was told, and Joseph were told, your son is going to be the savior of mankind. No pressure, but this is what's going to happen. And I wonder... You know, because you do feel a certain amount of pressure because nobody really, everybody as a parent, you're making it up as you go. They can give you all the, read the books, you can look at the YouTube videos, take all the classes. But in a sense, it's it's like a battle plan that a, that a general might draw up or a game plan a football coach might draw up. It's only good until the first shot gets fired or until the first play gets run. And then you realize, oh, crap, my running back just broke his leg. i got to change the plan. Or, oh, that defense is a little bit tougher than I thought. And it's the same thing. you got this beautiful baby boy or girl, 
and then it gets into the terrible tooth, and all the rest of it comes. But uh, we we have to, uh, as parents, we we move on with it, and so we can see the dreams and and everything that that Jesus' parents have and that John's parents have and the hopes uh, for their children. And then there's this guy, Caesar Augustus, Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus, a lot of times called Augustus Caesar, it doesn't matter. Uh, that is the one for whom the month of August is named, uh, and he did it because his uncle named July after himself. His uncle was Julius Caesar, and he was adopted by Caesar, and it was in uh, Julius's will that uh, Augustus was his heir. Uh, Julius basically ruled as a dictator. And so, and a lot of times Julius is erroneously called an emperor, but he wasn't. Rome was still sort of a republic then, but he eventually was becoming a dictator, and that eventually got him whacked. I mean, assassinated, going into the Senate meeting. Anyway, uh, his reign here for Augustus, 27 to uh, BC to 14 AD, and he initiated what became known as the Imperial Cult, where Roman... Uh, gods were or roman emperors rather were looked upon as deity and then the pax romana or the peace of rome or pax augusta the peace of augustus it was a very peaceful time when rome or when augustus was on the throne and rome uh, was reaching its greatest heights under his reign and rome it was not the debauched uh drinking partying uh sexually immoral nation that it became it was actually a fairly moral nation, kind of like the United States was uh, at one time. And now we're going downhill just like Rome is. He was born into an equestrian branch of a, a Latin-named family, Plebeian Gens Octavia. An equestrian means they were, they were the horse handlers. Uh, they took care of the horses. They were horse riders. They were very, uh, very skilled and accomplished horse riders. His maternal great uncle was Julius Caesar, who was assassinated in uh, 44 BC. So he would have been, Augustus would have been about 19, roughly, years old, if I did that math right in my head, when that happened. Civil War followed. Uh, he ended up having to take out Mark Antony and Brut or, um, Marcus uh, Leo, Leo Lepidius and uh, all the others that had assassinated uh, Caesar. Uh, in fact, it was he who eventually, it is believed, caused the death of Cleopatra. Whether she actually had a snake brought in in a basket, nobody knows. Uh, but she is believed, uh, the, he is believed to have at least forced her hand if she did commit suicide or he might have assassinated her. Uh, he was a little bit ruthless there. Okay. Now, you notice as we go along in the nativity that everyone mentioned is worshiping Jesus somehow. The angels we'll see here in the next installment were uh, worshiping him. And then the shepherds, once they got word from the angels and went into town to see what was going on, they worshiped. And then the wise men also worshiped. And do with this one what you will. But one source I looked at said the animals worshiped in their own way. And they cite Romans 1, where Paul talks about the creation versus the creator. Do with that what you will. Now, both Matthew and Mark are recording these events about Christ's birth. Now, you got a lot of critics, even some who say that they're Christians, who uh, consider the virgin birth to be a fable. It was just concocted by Matthew. Uh, and then Luke uh, took it and made his changes to it to cover up an illegitimate birth. Uh, someone like John Shelby Spong uh, believe uh, that, and he, he's wrote a book called uh, "Born of a Woman." You know, either either Mary was promiscuous or she was raped, probably by a Roman soldier. Uh, so Joseph was already betrothed to her, and so Matthew came up with this. Matthew basically lied, is what the the teaching is. And I'm not going to get, I've actually written a paper on this and I'm working on a, another book about this, uh, not just the virgin birth per se, but about Christianity and whether it's true or not. And the virgin birth, uh, Spong calls it a Mediterranean myth that Matthew picked. 
But you got to remember, Judaism is a monotheistic religion. It's one God with very strict prohibitions on worshiping other gods or even building images to them. So Matthew, being the most Jewish of all four gospel writers, why would he go for a Mediterranean myth? And if he's telling about Jesus, the Son of God, who talks about loving your neighbor and being uh, honest, uh, and how Satan is the father of all lies, why would he lie about this? Uh, how the, how Jesus came into the into into the world? And even if we assume Luke isn't a physician. And that this is assumed that just Luke is some anonymous writing because it doesn't tell us the, who the author is. Uh, why would he want to lie about the one who is supposed to be the Son of God and everybody's supposed to follow? It doesn't make any sense. Greek gods and goddesses carried many attributes of the humans. And if you notice that that is one of the big differences between the God of the Bible and the Greek gods, is they're basically just human. They are created in the image of humans. They have fights with each other, wars. They steal each other's wives. They supposedly mated with uh, earthly humans. But you don't see any of that from God. God says, no, you don't worship other gods. You don't even build images to them. And God has very strict rules about how he is to be worshipped. The pagans didn't have any of that. And to say that this was a, a, a Mediterranean or a Greek myth, you're very hard-pressed to find any pagan deity in these cultures born of a virgin. That it comes even close to what we see in Luke and in Matthew, particularly in Luke. In fact, uh, while Greco-Roman deities are claimed to have come from miraculous conceptions or births, to find a god among the pagan gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks and Romans that is anything like the god described in the Bible is difficult to impossible. Now, arguably, the religion that gets tagged as most resembling Christianity and is claimed to be the source of many Christian beliefs and practices is Mithraism. And this includes the virgin birth, uh, because Mithra was supposedly born of a virgin. We'll deal with that in just a second. Uh, he was the ancient Persian god of various things, including the rising of the sun, contracts, covenants, friendships. He oversaw the orderly change of the seasons. He legitimized the reigns of kings. Soldiers often invoked him before going into battle, so he became known as the god of war. So he was kind of a jack of all trades, or I don't know, maybe a god of all trades uh, would be uh, more appropriate. Uh, this cult spread from uh, Persia, got into India, and went as far uh, to the west as Spain, uh, got into Great Britain and Germany. The first written mention of uh, Mithra dates from about 1400 BC where his worship spread uh, uh, after that. When Alexander the Great came in and conquered the Persians, uh, that's how it got uh, throughout the Hellenistic world. And then uh, Mithraism, its first known practitioners were migratory groups uh, coming out of, uh, of uh, Persia, some into India. There's some indication that it was uh, in India as well at about the same time. And the Indo-Aryans who began settling in the region of Iran in northern India uh, were the ones that really got it going. And Iran, by the way, is the land of the Aryans. That's uh, how it gets translated. And now, during the time of the Roman Empire and the early days of Christianity, Mithraism, unlike Christianity, became basically a secret society. Kind of like the Masons or the Oddfellows or one of those kinds of groups. And throughout the Roman Empire, and largely the popularity was the Roman troops who went off into battle and found this religion and brought it home uh, with them and practiced it uh, at home. And then around Christmas time, you'll see the memes surface about how Jesus and Mithra have all these alleged uh, similarities. And it's obvious that whoever posts these things doesn't do their homework. Because the meme is inevitably wrong. I always say, don't trust the meme. I've got a couple of my two cents worth segments on that. Don't trust or don't believe the meme. Uh, comparing the alleged uh, uh, comparisons between Christianity and Mithraism, various, the website, uh, what is it, reasonsforjesus.com lists the supposed similarities between the Lord and, uh, and Mithras, and then deals with them and the theory is that christianity borrowed several points from mithraism 
And there's about a dozen alleged similarities, including the birth on December the 25th in a cave and being worshipped by shepherds. That's not true. Mithro, uh, there's several different uh, ideas as to where he came from. The most common one is that he literally crawled out from under a rock. And he is sometimes depicted as wrestling this bull. That's what's in this picture here. Uh, you can see he's got the literally the bull by the horns here. And so Mithro did not inspire the virgin birth accounts found in Christianity. The virgin birth as ascribed uh, the virgin birth was ascribed to Mithraism. So the Mithraism did not inspire the virgin birth accounts we find in Christianity. In fact, the virgin birth of Mithra was ascribed to Mithraism after the establishment of Christianity. It came along much later. Uh, and at Christmas time, I'll put up some more memes and things like that. Uh, to discuss, or more videos rather, to discuss those memes and show the refutation of them. So that is going to wrap it up for today. So as usual, we will go to God in prayer as we close out. Today we'll pray for the nation, our elected officials, especially in the United States. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks now since that attempt on Trump, and uh, we really need to tone down of the rhetoric on both sides. Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, we all need to dial it back quite a bit. So let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us another day. Thank you for all the things that you provide. And we want to especially lift up our nation, lift up the, uh, the our, our political situation here in America, Lord, and just pray that you'll help us to have peace as a nation, help our nation to be unified somehow, Lord, and help us to get back to the things that made us great, that we had that spiritual root. Help us, Lord, to uh, take the good and leave the bad. Help us, Lord, to uh, return ourselves to the heights that you helped us to attain. We want to pray, Lord, that you'll help us as Christians to share the gospel, to be firm for the truth, and to uh, not back down when it comes to sharing your truth and standing up for your truth. We pray that our elected officials will make righteous choices. We pray that uh, they'll uh, help efforts to bring about peace and righteousness in the nation. We thank you for Jesus and the forgiveness of sins he brings. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So that's it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below, or you can email them to me. Uh, if you have prayer requests, be glad to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. Thank you for watching. That's going to wrap it up for now. Don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and the notification bell. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. That's it for now. See you in the next video. I'm done. I am out and going for the coffee cup.